Hello, everyone. I'm Curtis Sittenfeld. I'm so excited to be talking today to Maggie Shipstead about Great Circle. Welcome to everyone watching in whatever part of the world you're in. I know we have lots of high street booksellers watching today. Thank you so much for everything you do. And we hope you enjoy the event. Hi, Maggie. Oh, hi. <laughs> Um, this is this is very exciting. I mean, I, I um, I'm not usually the MC, so I, I hope I will handle this well. Um, just so people know, there's a Q and A sort of box. I'm sure you've all done this before, and you can put questions in there at any time, and I will ask them of Maggie um, closer to the end of the hour if we haven't gotten to them. All right. So first, I have to say, Maggie, congratulations. I loved this book so much. And it's, it's truly, it's such a staggering um, literary achievement. And it's such a fun book to read. And that's like an amazing, amazing thing to pull <laughs> off. Uh, thank you so much. I mean, that means so much coming from a writer like you. And yeah, it's, it's amazing to have people reading it after such a long time. <laughs> Well, so so let's let's get started. I, I feel like as a writer, I'm sort of tempted to say like, how did you do this? But I think I think that like, how did you pull this off? But um, I guess maybe maybe a more general interest question is, when did you decide to write this book? And is is the book I read the book that you conceived of? Yeah, so I'm not so great at conceiving of the books. I sort of have a starting point and then I can't plan or outline or I just kill the whole thing. So what kind of happened was I was right between Seating Arrangements and Astonish Me. Like Seating Arrangements was out, Astonish Me was going into edits and this was um, some, like fall 2012, I think. And I had started another novel I thought would be my third novel. I'd written maybe a hundred pages and I'd been traveling in New Zealand um, for a month and kind of during that time, it just, the project died on me. And so I was feeling a little down about that. And I was at the airport in Auckland. I think the International Terminal is named after this pilot, Gene Batten, who is the first person to fly up solo from um, England to New Zealand um, in the thirties. And so there's this cool statue of her and, and there's a quote engraved next to it that says I was destined to be a wanderer. And something just kind of clicked. I was like, oh, I'm gonna write a book about an aviatrix. Um, and I just sort of put it in the back of my mind. I had to get through Astonish Me. And so it really wasn't until two years later, I started working in earnest. Um, and sort of, I'd had a couple false starts. I thought about setting it in Nebraska, which for those of you who aren't super familiar with uh, American geography is a very big flat state. It's like a 700 mile long cornfield. Um, and uh, I had spent two months in Missoula, still thinking I was studying the book in Nebraska. And then I moved to LA, got settled here in this room, which is my office. And kind of that's when I started. And all I knew is that it would be about a pilot who disappears while trying to fly around the world north south. Um, and then I just sort of started going and it, things kept piling on it. I always say it's like building a house without a blueprint. I just had sort of like a turret and a stairway to nowhere and doors that opened into walls and things like that. And so did you write it in order more or less or did you write different chunks at different times and then connect them? Um, I wrote it pretty much in order. Um, the So the, the sections with Hadley, the movie star, I think were the pieces that were in flux the longest, sort of where they were going to fall in the book. And I also, as the book is now, Marion's entire flight is sort of one piece together at the end. Um, and I had initially thought that I would, I would use those sections sort of interstitially throughout the book. Um, and so I, I wrote them kind of as I went, but sort of one too many things for the reader to keep track of. And it sort of sapped all that stuff of, of interest and um, tension. So that was kind of one of the biggest changes. I mean, going back to your question, which I didn't really answer, but is this the book I conceived of? I think this is a much larger book than I had planned to write. And my first two books, I wrote the drafts, the first drafts of each of them in under a year. And so I was like, I'm a person who writes books in less than a year. And it turns out I was sorely mistaken. Um, it took three years and three months to write the first draft of this. 
Um, and then it was about another year before we sold it. And then it's been two years and eight months since, uh, since I sold it. So it was, it was a much bigger, longer process than I had imagined. And, and that's probably for the best because there were plenty of times I was just seriously overwhelmed um, by how much was left to do and kind of what I'd gotten myself into. Um, I have like eight questions based on what you just said, but one quick question is why was there, why did so much time pass between when the book sold and when it was published? Um, I, that would be a little bit of a question for my editor at Knopf. I mean, some of it was timing, but I would say most of it was just the length of the book and our edits were quite serious. Like when I sold it, so the, the printed book is six, under 600 pages, which was about 750 manuscript pages. But when I sold it, it was 980 manuscript pages. It was almost 300,000 words. Um, and everyone agreed it needed to get shorter, but that was a whole process. Um, so I think sh she and I did more rounds of edits than either of my other books, like maybe three or even four. Um, you know, and each one took some months and then uh, we had a nice long runway leading up to publication. So it, it all turned out really well. And of course, no one could have anticipated the pandemic. Um, so it's kind of nice this moment where things are starting to open up a little bit and sort of the themes of the book maybe play into that hopefully, so. Yeah, um, I feel like, I think the book is gonna become like an enormous bestseller and then you'll be able to like, offer like you know like the unreleased like the director's cut with those other 300 pages or like it'll be like a novella like the the sort of well, like the mixtape oh. um <laughs> I mean actually what how we ended up shrinking it was mostly just pervasive small cuts and it was so long that if I just cut a little bit on every page that added up to like 200 pages I've been there I've been there it's funny I one time had an editor say to me um, she said, I want you to cut 200 pages. And I said, are you saying to me that you want me to cut 200 pages because then I'll cut 100? And she said, no, I really want you to cut 200. So, and I, th I think I cut 120. Um, so <laughs> I want to get back to the, you know, the sort of idea or the genesis of the book. So did you, going into it, did you know more about aviation than the average person and you know, whatever the answer is to that, what sort of research did you do? Because I, I suspect you did a massive amount. Yeah, I would say I didn't know much about aviation. Um, my brother is just retiring from the Air Force after 20 years, and he doesn't fly anymore, but he used to fly um, C-130s, the big cargo planes with four propellers. Um, and he's I, it seems to me like most or many pilots are like this, where just as children, they know that they have to do this. And he was obsessed with airplanes as a child and always wanted to fly. Um, so that was always kind of his thing, you know, and I had my own interests and just left the airplanes to him. But he was a really helpful resource, um, especially early on. Like I kind of, I researched as I went along as things presented themselves. Um, but one of the first questions I wanted to answer was, would a north-south round the world flight be feasible kind of in the immediate post-war era and what where, what kind of plane would you use where would you land um and he really helped me with that like we sat down with a map and you know talked about like you probably wouldn't choose a line through the ussr and there were a ton of airstrips built in the south pacific during the war and so that would be helpful um and then I just, I started reading, you know, books by pilots, books about pilots. Um, that was extremely helpful. Some sort of more technical um, stuff about flying. Uh, when I could, I would find um, sort of unusual aircraft to go in. Like I did some glacier flights. I, um, in sort of a piece of dual research, I really wanted to get on, um, Ideally, I would have been on the Antarctic ice sheet because I knew that was going to figure in and I, I wanted to know what it looked like, but that's exorbitantly expensive. So on a magazine story, I actually flew to Greenland with our unit of the Air National Guard that does all our polar airlift. And so we flew in a C-130 um, to Greenland and landed on the ice sheet. So I got the experience both of landing on ice and being sort of surrounded by this endless circle of ice and snow under just blue sky. And 
which is a, such a simple image, but really difficult to sort of imagine the feeling of. Um, so yeah, just kind of bit by bit as I went, both sort of in book form and, and in the form of experience too and travel, but um, yeah, things would just come up. I'd be like, this should start with a ship launch in Glasgow in 1909. And I was like, oh no, <laughs> you know, now I have to figure out <laughs> what that would even entail and like, how you build a ship. So there were a million different things like that that came up as I went. Um, did, did you pilot a plane or sort of co-pilot a plane the way, you know, Hadley, the actress goes up in the plane and sort of, um, did you, have you done that? It's so, it's so funny you picked up on that, that when Hadley takes a flying lesson and does not like it, that was kind of what happened with me. And it was, it was actually in a glider so I think that's extra weird, like not having an engine and, and the pilot was sitting behind me and he was like, okay, like you can turn it. And I turned it and I was like, oh, it just was, it felt so precarious. I also have really poor sort of spatial relations. Like I'm just defeated by three dimensions and flying is so three dimensional um, that I just, I think all of my instincts would be wrong. And so I really didn't want to do it. And I thought about really taking lessons, but ultimately it seemed like I didn't really need to. And so I know you've written a fair amount of nonfiction that involves travel to what many people would think of as sort of far flung destinations. Um, did, did you feel like you were, you know, during the years you were taking trips and like writing magazine pieces was that research for the novel was it its own adventure because it's what you wanted to do with your life yeah both um it really it's funny how much my life kind of changed during the period I was writing this book and, and to a great degree because of the book um you know, my first two books came out within two years of each other. So I also thought, you know, I'm a person who writes a book in less than a year and I'm a person who just puts out books and that's all I do. And, and kind of two years into drafting Great Circle as I realized I wasn't even halfway done, um, you know, I kind of started to have a different idea about what took up my time and, and kind of where my energy went and my life sort of moved away from the book world pretty dramatically. And um, I started travel writing in 2015, sort of hap by happenstance, an editor I knew went to travel and leisure, and so offered me an assignment to Hawaii kind of out of the blue, and I was like, yeah, and so after that I started pitching, um, and I, my second assignment was for Condé Nast Traveler to the New Zealand sub-Antarctic, which was kind of a game changer, and um, was <laughs> where I met uh, someone who I then was in a relationship with and he ran expeditions to Antarctica. So I went to Antarctica for the first time um, with him kind of immediately after that. And then I would pitch polar stuff and stories and places where I thought I, I needed to see for the book. Like, I don't really think you have to go everywhere that you write about, but some places like and I would say Antarctica would be a place that would be very difficult to imagine um, and I sort of had a sense of that and same with the Arctic and so as I pitched these stories and and then did them editors were like oh you know Maggie likes these weird polar stories so then when one would come up they'd often offer it to me so I became sort of a specialist in like weird high latitude travel um, which I love and captivates me and, and I'm also totally drawn to like these stark landscapes and that sort of thing. So, um, you know, things, one thing leads to another. So I started, yeah, doing more sort of rugged travel and adventure travel, which really helped the book. And the book was sort of why I got doing it in the first place. It became this sort of cycle of, um, yeah, research and experience. And it was, uh, I would, I mean, I think essential isn't too strong a word to use for, for how it influenced the book. Would you say prior to, you know, sort of starting the book or prior to like 2014 or 15, you had been like a rugged traveler or <laughs> that, like, like growing up, had your family gone to faraway destinations or, you know, done really rugged camping or that sort of thing? Definitely not. No. And that's still something that's like an aspiration of mine is to become more competent in the outdoors. And so I have sort of these long hikes I want to do. I've started doing um, multi-day treks, things like that. But no, I was, um, 
I was a really shy child and very sort of novelty averse, like a classic family story was, I think I was five and we were visiting my grandparents in Michigan. And my mom was like to me and my brother, do you want to go to Niagara Falls? I had no idea what Niagara Falls was, but I just burst out crying. I didn't want to go anywhere or <laughs> see anything. Um, and as I got a little bit older, you know, I sort of fancied myself a traveler the way teenagers do. Um, but I, I think like I went to Europe with my mom when I was 14. We went to Russia the following year sort of randomly, which was a really odd and interesting time to go. That was like 1998. Um, and then, yeah, I didn't do much travel other than that until I was um, writing Astonish Me and I traveled alone for five months. Um, and most of the time I, I was in Paris at an artist residency there. Um, but yeah, no, not, I've never been really outdoorsy. We didn't do a ton of camping. No one else in my family seems into the poles, <laughs> um, but I'm always really captivated by people who have those skills and experiences. And I've met a lot of them doing these stories. I just am sort of awed by um, people who feel comfortable in these harsh environments and have these specialized skills and knowledge. And I think it's really exotic and interesting. Yeah. I, I agree. I, um, I want to get back to the, the sort of plot and structure a little bit. At what point did you decide to have these dual timelines where, you know, there's not just Marion's timeline, but there's Hadley's timeline, um, which I, I mean, again, there was so much about the book I loved, but to have two timelines where I, as the reader, loved them both equally, like I was in heaven, because, you know, and they're, they're so tonally different. Um, so how, how did, was Hadley's timeline there from the beginning or, you know, was it that a later edition? It was pretty much there. I, I think within the first three or four weeks of when I started writing the book, I wrote one of Hadley's sections and it's the one where, um, for those who haven't read it, this is this movie star and she's in sort of a Twilight-esque like romantic film franchise and she's dating her co-star and she sort of publicly cheats on him. Like she leaves a nightclub with this pop star and it's she knows she's being photographed. Um, I wrote that section first and on the surface of it, it had absolutely nothing to do with, you know, the shipbuilding parts I was already writing and my idea to have this pilot. Um, and so I think, then I was like, well, the way I can connect to this is to have her be in a biopic. But I had really just a loose idea of how they would connect. Um, but it was important to me to have, I didn't want to write just sort of a solid loaf of historical fiction. Um, I felt like that would just be too much or too dense or something. And so um, I knew Hadley would never be an equal they wouldn't be balanced. Like sh her sections would be smaller, but in this more intense voice. And I wanted it to be sort of like a, like an acidic or a sour note, you know, like kind of the squeeze of lemon. Um, but it also gave me a way to sort of have this lens on the idea that, you know, just the limits of how well we can know other people. And so the reader knows Marion quite well, like almost you, you see Marion, I think pretty much through Marion's own eyes. And then Hadley's in this position in the future, sort of trying to make sense of this past life, give, which has more evidence than most lives do. Like Marion left behind sort of a diary and she was not famous, but known during her lifetime. Um, and the reader can sort of see the distortion that happens in that translation, this sort of game of telephone over the decades. Um, so I really wanted that sort of perspective from, from Hadley. Um, I think that works perfectly. That's a perfect way to describe it is like the, the acidic or the, the lemoniness of it where, um, because you know, her, the sort of conversational tone of her sections is, is such a pleasure, but but I, I feel like she's also, I liked the fact that you made her very intelligent. Like I think that sometimes people have a reflexive impulse to to make a Hollywood actress, you know, sort of dumb. And, and I think she's very self-aware, um, which leads me to another question. Uh, you know, there's so much that's sort of grappling with 
um, you know, like the limitations for women or women's ambitions coming up with the expectations of other people. And did you feel like um, you know, did you think I want to write about these themes and I'm going to find a plot to do this? Or was it more like you were developing a plot and these themes just kind of emerged organically? Yeah, I definitely was working from the plot outward. I kind of never think about theme, although the one theme I did think about was scale. Like that was what I articulated to myself. Like at some point a friend was like, what would you how would you describe this book in one word? And I was like, scale, <laughs> um, which I was interested in sort of a life and the planet and like a life and time and a life and other lives, all these things. Um, but with sort of how, you know, female experience came into it, I think, you know, it's kind of a feminist act just to consider as a woman to consider yourself having free will, you know, that's sort of the root of it all. Right. And so Marion has this kind of feral childhood where it doesn't necessarily occur to her that her gender might limit her. And then as she gets older and she wants to do this very specific thing of fly, she starts to hit these impediments. Um, and so writing about a woman in that era who wants kind of freedom above all else inevitably it sort of took on yeah f some feminist themes and then I think also writing about a movie star like Hadley who's you know in some ways much more liberated than Marion just living in an era where more options for lives are um, mainstream and acknowledged for women but as a famous person, she just, it's sort of not possible to do it right as far as being a woman, like, you know, be sexy, but don't have sex or like, you know, be in a relationship, but the relationship has to be perfect, but we don't like perfection, this sort of endless pressure in all directions that gets put on her. And, you know, I think people often respond to celebrities and are like, well, wow, like you're still rich and famous and you asked for this and you sought this out. and. Certainly that's true, but also I think people are people who are truly massively famous have no means of imagining that. I, I'm not sure it's possible until you live it. And then I think it's it's can be extremely difficult. So And yeah. did you did you do um sort of Hollywood research, you know, comparable to aviation research? And and am I correct that you grew up in LA or sort of adjacent to LA and live there now? I live in LA now. I grew up um, in Orange County, so south of here, but like equidistant between LA and um, San Diego. And it's sort of just this suburban sprawl. It's not at all urban. So it's quite different from LA. Um, I did definitely do some research on Hollywood. Uh, here in LA, the vast majority of my friends work in Hollywood in some capacity, um, either in development or as agents or as actors or as writers, a lot of TV writers. Um, so I have sort of an ambient sense of it. And I'd written one short story kind of years ago, told in a similar voice as Hadley's. It was a really sort of intense first person movie star voice. And it was about, it was kind of a Tom Cruise, Nicole Kidman Scientology story. And I really liked sort of taking an assumption of knowledge on the um, reader's part, like people are, I guess this is, I'm describing cliche. Um, <laughs> people are sort of familiar with the way the story works and like, how do you riff on that? And how do you sort of use that as a shortcut to getting somewhere else, you know? And so I felt like I wanted to do more of that with Hadley and sort of take these in some ways, classic Hollywood arcs, which are classic or familiar cliche for a reason, you know, because they do happen all the time. Like being a child star often doesn't bode well for your sort of adjustment into adulthood. And that's one thing Hadley grapples with. And there's sort of a me too issue in there, which I think was in there even before the Harvey Weinstein story broke. But I remember being struck by the Weinstein story that I mean, even just living in LA and not working in Hollywood, no one was surprised. Like everybody knew this about this person. And so on the one hand, it was a huge bombshell. And on the other hand, it was like completely unsurprising. And I think there's a lot in our culture that works like that. Like there've been casting couch jokes forever. And um, so yeah, just sort of 
taking all of that stuff and sort of applying a stronger kind of stylistic voice to it than the other parts of the book and, and just seeing what I could do with it. I, I found fun and also just a nice break <laughs> from like reading about airplanes. Um, you know, it's interesting. I, I, on the one hand, I certainly would not say that the, the kind of LA starlet um, plots are cliche. Like I think I would, and this, it might be defensive on my part because I think I do this with my fiction where I would choose to say like, you're taking something the reader is familiar with and therefore like the writer's awareness of the reader's familiarity allows you to have this sort of richer, more knowing conversation. Almost like if you and I know someone in common, we can have a pretty juicy conversation about that person. Whereas if I know someone and I'm describing that person to you, it's it's like, you know, hopefully it's still interesting, but it's not that kind of interactive, um, you know, like, like mutual confluence. Um, I think so, that's exactly right. And I'm totally going to steal that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's funny because I didn't, I felt like I didn't know this about myself until very recently. Sometimes these conversations are very useful. Like one, one day years ago, one of my sisters said to me something like, she was like, I think you're smarter when you do events than you are in real life. Where like, <laughs> like you almost are like asked questions that you, you know, you're just writing and like, and like, you're not, you know, like, like it, I think at times it's, it's can be really annoying to be asked about one's choices. And then at times it can be very, very illuminating. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So did you have any sort of, is there any secret favorite character? I mean, there's so many characters and you do such a tremendous job making them distinct and like three dimensional and, um, you know, going into like, even when it's in the third person going into their perspective. And is there any character that you would get to their scenes and kind of like <laughs> clap your hands with delight <laughs> that, you, that you got to go into that perspective? Um, I don't think so, but I think that's partly due to just the way I write, which is that I'll often use point of view shifts as a source of momentum. So I'll kind of exhaust a point of view and then, and because I also haven't planned in any way, then I sort of have to look around and be like, well, now what, you know? And so whichever point of view sort of presents itself in a utilitarian way is the one I go with. But yeah, I, I think if there was any I relished writing, it was probably Hadley's um, the most. And I think it was just because of how different it was and because it required less research. <laughs> the research was just, you know, I'd get going and then I'd, I'd make some, come across some detail. Like for example, Jamie, Marion's twin brother is a, um, an artist in the military during World War II and, and um, this was a real job. All the branches of the military recruited visual artists to sort of document the war. And I hadn't thought of that until I happened to cr cross a documentary about these painters. And I was like, oh no, <laughs> now I have to learn more about war artists. <laughs> That's amazing. It's so funny because I think there are like maybe even three separate characters who in the book express surprise that when Jamie's like here I am on this remote island to paint pictures of you know people killing each other and people are like well something new every day you know when he says I I too did not know that that position existed um I have two sort of like interrelated um maybe I don't know if these are metaphorical questions but it's you know as a reader whenever there's a character who's kind of artistic as both Jamie and, you know, Marion and Jamie's uncle is, um, it's sort of like my antennae go up in terms of, it can seem like, you know, maybe the, the writer is making some comments on, on creativity. And so I did, I did wonder um, if, I don't know, like if you felt like there were parallels between being a writer and being an artist as Jamie is and sort of, you know, in an overlapping but separate way, you know, Marion, it kind of almost like can't say why she feels compelled to take on this incredibly ambitious flying project, but she does. And did you feel like, were there parallels for you between like, I, I want to write this massive, ambitious book, 
Um, and, and, you know, I don't necessarily know why, but I'm going to do it. Like, did, did, you feel, <laughs> did you see yourself in either, or just did you see your, your sort of artistic undertaking in either Jamie or Marion? I never made the Marion connection. I'll come back to that one. I think, um, yeah, definitely by the time I got to where Jamie's sort of an adult artist, I think the way I describe what he's trying to do with his paintings did have a lot of resonance, which is he's trying, he's sort of interested in the limitations of a canvas. So, you know, even just the way our vision works, we can see so much and that just can't be translated to a flat canvas. And so he's sort of experimenting with like warping and folding and in, in his images to try and sort of get at, again, this sort of scale. And so this book, you know, by that point, I was very aware that that's what I was trying to do as well. And there are these sort of, you know, sections that are, I call the incomplete histories. And I might sort of like zoom through geological time in Missoula or zoom through aviation history. And it was a way of um, sort of suggesting where the book fell in the context of the real world and sort of expressing, again, this sort of, um, capaciousness or expansiveness um, sort of surrounding the characters. <laughs> the Marion, the question of why she wants to fly around the world is funny because it really became this bugaboo between me and my agent, who's my first reader. And so she read this, you know, gargantuan first draft. And then I think we talked on the phone. It took us three or four days to get through the whole conversation. It was like an eight hour ah. conversation where she was giving me notes. It was so brutal. Um, and she kept being like, well, why does she want to do this? And to me, it just made sense. I'm like, she just, like, because it's there, you know, sort of the Mount Everest line. Um, and so then in, I think the next draft, I, I sort of addressed that. And, and my agent was like, I feel like you're trolling me <laughs> now that um, you talk about that there is no why. But one thing that was really helpful for me was this book by Alex Wilkinson, Wilkerson called The Ice Balloon. It was about this totally doomed um, attempt, I think in 1912, 1914, something like that, to fly across the North Pole in a hot air balloon. And so they leave from Svalbard, merrily go sailing off, you know, don't make it all that far, crash and die. Um, but he has a paragraph in the book that's about how these sort of early explorers were in some ways driven by the very obscurity of their own desires like to them that seemed persuasive like they just had a vision of themselves doing something and they couldn't say why but the fact that they couldn't say why was somehow an argument for it and that really resonated with me and sort of shed a lot of light on the kind of instinctive feeling I had for why Marion would do this and you know, I don't think she quite knows. And the whole nature of the circular flight path too, is that if she had completed it, you're right back where you started. And there's just this horizon in front of you all over again. And what does that mean? What have you accomplished? Um, so those were sort of questions that, that I had guiding the book. And, and I think it does probably connect to my process although again I just stumbled into this like into a cave with no flashlight and it was really two years into writing the first draft when I had 400 pages and I knew I wasn't halfway done when I was like oh dear <laughs> and from then on I just had to put my head down and kind of focus on what I could do day by day because otherwise it was just absolutely overwhelming. That's interesting that it became more overwhelming sort of the more pages you had written rather than less mm. overwhelming. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it was because I knew, I was like, oh, this has been so much work and so much time. And I know I have to do at least that much work again. <laughs> you know? oh, that was a bad day. Uh, well, I mean, uh, let me say again, I feel like it, it paid off enormously. Like there's just, uh, there's probably, if I were going to make a list of all the like large and small things that I like, you know, admired and was tickled by and like thought, how did she do that? I feel like there would be like a hundred literally. So um, one question I had was, did you consider um, writing a sort of fictionalized version of a real aviatrix, which is a word I'm gonna now use as much as possible. That's, great. That's a good word, yeah. <laughs> um, or, and I, I have to say that I got a kick out of 
the there's the sort of you know fake biography within the fake biography of by Carol <laughs> Fe did you say Pfeiffer or Pfeiffer? Yeah, yeah. Like, um and and all um and and I, I like love you know again if people haven't read it I don't want to spoil it but I love the stuff that she gets wrong about you know um did you did you consider that at all like taking some I mean maybe like not Amelia Earhart but some more obscure figure and fictionalizing her life or was it clear that you wanted to just invent your own character yeah I don't think I did consider it um but I was I would say like Amelia Earhart was also part of the seed idea um mostly because I think it's really interesting the place she occupies in our culture. I mean, during kind of the 20s and 30s, there are quite a few famous female pilots, like really household names. And Amelia Earhart's pretty much the only one that's remembered in the US anyway. Um, I think, you know, Beryl Markham, um, Bessie Johnson sometimes in the US, Amy Johnson sometimes in the UK, but it's, partly because of how famous Amelia Earhart was in her lifetime, but I think it's really about her disappearance. And to me, it seems overwhelmingly likely, if not certain, that she just crashed into the ocean and drowned. <laughs> like it sucks, but the ocean is huge. And she was really close to the island she was trying to land on. And any of these sort of places that get bandied about as where she might have landed instead are really far away. She just would not have had the fuel and it would have been sort of a navigational miracle. So I think it's strange that decades later, you know, people are still out there looking for clues to what really happened, but the, what really happened is actually abundantly clear. So to me, this difference between, um, is Curtis gone? <laughs> I'm going to, Ah, she's back. <laughs> you vanished, uh, but you're back. <laughs> I know. We, as, as we were discussing Amelia Earhart's vanishing, we, we both vanished. Okay. I can Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So, yeah, I was just, you know, we perceive disappearance and death differently, even though I think probably most of the time they're the same thing. So that sort of, you know, distinction really captivated me and, and, um, yeah, just why what we talk about when we talk about Amelia Earhart, I think, is is something that I still kind of mull over a lot. Um, I hope you're writing a sort of um, like great circle adjacent essay that's titled "What We Talk About." When we talk about <laughs> I've kind of tried. Yeah, I'm, I am thinking about it, but <laughs> we'll see. I mean, it was. It, I also thought that you had such sort of interesting commentary on you know that Marion is a little bit. Um, you know, mocking or disapproving of some of the other aviatrixes, <laughs> aviatrices, um, sort of, you know, almost like playing on their femininity. And then she kind of recognizes, you know, what the purpose is. And another thing, I'm, I'll be curious in the long run, what feedback you get, but, but something I loved is, I mean, I, I loved, and it was very understandable to me that Marion almost has difficulty articulating her motives and I I loved it seemed consistent with like you know people don't the characters don't necessarily do things for like the right reasons or the most most impressive reasons and you know they all like almost all of them have I don't know there's there's like this big discrepancy between what the public wishes to think about them and who they really are and all that stuff just felt so real to me instead of being like a very idealized person who who is selfless and like speaks very eloquently about their their goals and their which i mean again who who does that in in real life um so before we turn to the the audience q a i have i think this will be my last question for now um is is there a part of the book um that you feel most proud of Um, I don't know if this is the same thing as pride, but there are definitely, if I'm like thinking about the book or having that feeling, you know, where you're like, was that okay? Like, should I just double check, you know, read a few pages? Um, I'll often read from Marion's flight 
um, particularly the Antarctica part, which was um, really important to me to get right. I'll sometimes read the very end, which I won't spoil for people. Um, and then I was kind of proud, I guess, of the, there's a sequence where Hadley and the producer of her film do shrooms. And it's I kind love of, that. I love it. <laughs> it's probably, it's definitely the most voicey part of the book. It might be the most voicey thing I've ever written. Um, and I just had the idea for it one day, really early on when I was leaving the gym here in LA and there's kind of this green post sunset sky and and it just I just sort of thought of it and then picked away at it sort of for off and on as maybe a year or more while I was writing um but yeah that was just something really different for me and and trying something new so I I feel good about that one too um I love all those words I mean again I think that that's why like I feel like for a novel to succeed it has to have a lot going on and like a lot has to be well done. And I do think, I mean, those sections you're describing like when she's flying in Antarctica and like, I feel like oh, I'm about to freeze to death. Like that's, you know, magnificently done. And then like, you know, a, a beautiful famous actress doing shrooms in LA. Like, I feel like I'm a beautiful famous actress. <laughs> and it's an, it's an achievement to get, I'm, I'm actually a 45 year old in Minnesota. Um, okay, I'm gonna turn to the Q and A. Let's see, oh, just a comment. This is a fascinating conversation. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> um, okay, I'm, I'm gonna try to pronounce this correctly. <laughs> Did you visit Glasgow? Is it Glasgow? I don't even, I, 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 Did you visit Glasgow, Maggie? I have been there um, very briefly. I've spent quite a bit of time in Edinburgh um, in that five month period when I was writing Astonish Me, the last month of it, I was in Edinburgh um, and have been back several times. And so one time I just took a day trip, but it was before I was writing the book. So I didn't know what to look for. Um, so that had to be sort of researched retroactively, unfortunately, with the, the shipbuilding and the River Clyde and et cetera. Um, I loved, I mean, again, I, I don't want to give it away, but I love that, like, by the time I sort of came back to Matilda, I thought like, wait, that Matilda? <laughs> like, is that this thing? <laughs> and I, I, I also will, will say that, um, again, without giving anything away, it's amazing to me that you didn't outline this in, in terms of, like, I just think it comes together at the end in such a sort of surprising but wonderful way that that's, that's amazing. Um, okay. Uh, with such a vast scale, is there a moment in Marion's story that is fixed most prominently in your mind or which comes to your mind first when you think about her? Hmm. I think maybe when she first encounters um, the airplanes. So these, these barnstorming pilots come to Missoula in 1927, I think it's the same day that Charles Lindbergh flies across the Atlantic. Um, and to me, that was sort of the kind of pivot point um, in her life, of course, where she sort of conceives of, of who she'll be. Um, so I, th I think that's what sprang to mind uh, in this case. Um, and just to briefly circle back to the organizational question, I will say what I could not, I don't know, do you write on Scrivener? No, I don't, oh. but I've heard it. Do you want to briefly describe just in case not everyone's familiar? Yeah, so I wrote this book on a, um, a writing application called Scrivener. Um, in my previous books I'd written on Microsoft Word and it's a little difficult to explain, but what Scrivener allows you to do is have sort of this list of documents. So I had, you know, all the sections of the book and there's something like 70. Um, and you can very easily open them side by side. You can rearrange the order. Um, you can just sort of see what you have in a way you can't with one huge word document or with having, you know, 70 different chapter documents, that sort of thing. So that was an absolute game changer. And I, when I think about doing this without it, I would, I, I don't think it would be possible. And was that because you would have to refer back and say like, what was that character's name in the, you know, in the brothel and, or. Kind of, or I just, because, um, there were so many moving parts, just being able to move things around um, and see what the order was and where things were falling was was really helpful. Um, it's interesting. I feel like maybe, maybe Scrivener should like hire you to be, uh, you know, like in their ads or something because you're kind of convincing. Like when people say to me, what's the hardest part of writing a book? I think they, 
expect me to say like, you know, the muse doesn't always come. And I feel like it's like the management of paper and thinking like, did I put those changes in or did I not put those changes in? And, you know, um, okay. So Brandy says, can't wait to read it. My question, living in LA and having a social network that is in the industry, how do you keep yourself from writing a novel without tailoring it to be optioned, especially when Hollywood is part of the story? And if you did visualize it being optioned, any actors, living or not, you pictured as characters? Um, yeah, it's funny. I don't think about it partly because I think, you know, both my books have kind of had options come and go. Like they get optioned. It seems like it might happen. It doesn't. Seating arrangements is currently under option, but it's like just big old shruggy guy if it happens. And, and in some ways that's ideal. Like I get free money and don't have to do anything or worry about anything. Um, but I also think you know, if somebody were to adapt one of my books, I'd rather have it be a good TV series um, or movie, probably series, than be true to the book. So I see it as something quite separate. Um, this book is a little bit hard to imagine. And I think my agent, my film agent is like a little skeptical <laughs> about it. Really? Um, I, I, well, she just sent it out and she's like, oh, I, could, I have to send this to the real readers because it's long. And so she's sort of like, yeah, we'll see. I don't know. Um, so it's not, not something I really stress out about very much. But the only actress I really thought who I could see playing Marion would be um, Saoirse Ronan. Really? Mm -hmm. Oh, I can, I can totally see. It. It's funny. That didn't occur to me. I think I will say because of the parallels in the book, um, between Hadley's movie franchise and Twilight, I did think of Kristen Stewart. Um, For Hadley. Which would be very, very meta, like it would be. Yeah. Um, uh, have you written for... Nope, you froze. Well, Curtis, while you're frozen, if you can tell that you're frozen, I think you're about to ask me if I'd written for TV. <laughs> and I have not. Um, I have a lot of friends who do it. And um, it's it's just so different. It's so collaborative. Um, right now, everything's in Zoom. So people are in these Zoom writers rooms, you know, five days a week for hours and hours. And I think, oh, you're back. Um, okay. 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 <laughs> um, I think... I don't know. Yeah, I just I'm not used to collaborating. Um, uh, but may I maybe I'm sort of if I get the option back for seating arrangements, I would maybe consider trying to adapt it myself. But um, we'll see. Wait, you're frozen again. I'm gonna look at the Q and A and see what we have here. Um, two kind compliments from Fiona. And then Sam asks, did you find any scenes in the book particularly challenging to write and why? Mm. You know, I will say more than any individual scene, the most challenging part was the connective tissue between the two stories. So between Marion's plotline and um, Hadley's and that was really one of the last things to fall into place. Um, I struggled with the ending of Hadley's story. I struggled how tightly to bind them together without it being too sort of neat and cute. Um, and yeah, that was sort of a persistent, uh, persistent challenge. And then the, some of the sections I dreaded writing, but were actually fine once I got into them was um, during the Second World War, uh, Jamie Marion's brother finds himself in the Aleutian Islands and there's these sort of obscure battles that happened out there. And, and so it was just a, a different thing than I'd written before. Um, but I was able to find some great firsthand accounts from um, the era and, and uh, that really helped. So. Curtis is gone. It's just me alone talking to my computer. Uh, let's see, what else? Hi, I'm just joining now. I'm from the <laughs> publishers. I've been in the back end of the uh, Zoom, but I'm just going to jump in now. 
um, to help with the Q&A while we wait for Curtis to join again. Oh. Um, so quick question here from Tabitha. Did you miss your characters after you left them after writing the book? Well, I believe what she actually asked is, did you kiss your characters after you <laughs> sharing the book? The answer is no. Um, I did not. I was so happy to be done. Um, and of course, you're sort of never done. Um, so I, you know, did all these rounds of edits with my editor. And then you have to do copy edits. And then you have to do two rounds of page proofs. And it's a long book. And so reading a 600 page book, you know, 10 times is a really good way not to miss some characters <laughs> by the time it's all over. Amazing. I'm so sorry that I'm not Curtis Sittenfeld. This is not who uh, everybody wants to see. I'm just looking for more questions in the chat. Lucy says about halfway through and obsessed with this book. It's so rich and well written. Agree. I think we'll just give it a few more minutes for more questions and see if Curtis pops back up. I think she's back. Okay. Nope, just she's gone again. Well, I mean, we kind of got there, right? Unless anyone has last minute. Oh, a few more questions. Oh, here oh, they come. Oh, they're all coming in. Uh, do you see yourself in any of the characters? Um, to degree, sure. Um, as, as you know, as telling Curtis, my travels sort of started to take over my life um, while I was writing this. And, and that involves some confrontations with fear. Um, like just as an example, I have always been afraid of deep water, um, but I really wanted to swim in the ocean with humpback whales, which you can do in Tonga. And so I pitched a magazine story where I'd swim with whales. And the whole time I didn't know if when I jumped in the open ocean, just out in the middle of it, if I would be terrified. Um, so I, I had to sort of take the risk, it was fine. And then that sort of built into doing more things like that. So I'd sort of, um, connected with Marion's boundary pushing in that way. And then happily also uh, some of her uh, judgmentalness and occasional harshness I connect to <laughs> pretty strongly. Amazing. Um, I've seen a few people are asking the same question, which I kind of hesitate to ask you given that um, I know what an endeavor it was um, to write Great Circle, but are you working on any future novels? So yeah. Joe says, what are you working on next? <laughs> um, I am writing another novel. I think, so I have a collection of short stories coming out next, um, which we sold with this book. Uh, and then, yeah, I have started a new novel. It, I had a few false starts. I was kind of writing a mystery um, and for various reasons decided not to. And this I've started an and in my head, I'm further along than I am. Like I told my agent I'd written hundred pages and then I checked I'd written 60 pages. <laughs> um, but my starting point is a question of what happens when two people who don't like each other get married and stay married. Um, so I think this one's gonna stick, but we'll see. Hopefully it won't take quite as long to write. There should not be a research component never doing that again very exciting um and i can see lots of hooray mentions uh, <laughs> submitted as questions here um i think we'll just do one more question and then call it a day um are there minor characters you'd like to go back to or who at one point you thought might appear more prominently um trying to think back on them i think not really i think if anything minor characters grew more than I expected, like Jamie, Marion's brother, I didn't necessarily expect to have such a large role as he did. Um, and he actually had a different, a bit of a different arc in, in the draft that I sold. And he like settled in Canada in this community. Um, these people are called Dukabors. They're basically Russian Quakers and they emigrated to Canada and they live in this sort of communal um, pacifist way and are super, super interesting. Um, but my editor Knopf was like, it's like one weird thing too many. <laughs> and she was exactly right. So it was, it was always sort of a question of um, striking the right balance with those characters and not letting them take over, but also allowing them to sort of enlarge um, the book and the world that it, that it contained. 
Amazing. Well, all these characters have stayed in my heart. I'm sure they have in everybody else's too. If you haven't read it yet, then your copy will be in the post to you if you've um, signed up for a copy through us. And just congratulations again, Maggie, on such an incredible achievement. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining us. Uh, I'm sorry that I have finished this off not as well as Sit and Bell, but you still had Maggie and her amazing words about Great Circle, um, which is out on the 4th of May. So now I'll just say thank you, everybody. And thank you so much, Maggie, for your time. Thank you. It was so fun. And thanks to Curtis. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Bye, everyone. Bye.